Hi, and welcome to Informatics in the Round. I'm Kevin Johnson. This is my podcast, where we discuss hot topics in informatics so that, as we can say, anyone can get it. First of all, before we begin, I wanted to give a shout out to another podcast that's in the informatics space, and that's Jason Moore and Marilyn Ritchie, who have a podcast out of the University of Pennsylvania called the Informatics Roundtable, or the Biomedical Informatics Roundtable. You can find it on all of the usual sites, iTunes, Spotify, etc., and also SoundCloud, and I'd encourage you all to give it a listen. It's quite a bit more at a technical level, whereas we try to stay at a, at a much higher level on this podcast. So depending on your level of interest in the field, please give us both a listen and see what you think. It's kind of a great one-two punch, in my opinion. Well, this month we have a really interesting podcast that a number of people had hoped we would cover. This is all about artificial intelligence or augmented intelligence. Those new technologies that promise to essentially help with the categorization of diseases, help us pick the right treatments for patients, and in lots of ways, help to augment the care that's already being given by doctors, nurses, and other healthcare providers. So I'm really glad we have an opportunity to talk about this fairly early in the podcast. We're very fortunate to have two experts in the department here. Michael Mefaney is an associate professor of biomedical informatics and of medicine in our department and was one of the co-authors on a recent report about artificial intelligence that we'll discuss today. But wait, there's more. Tom Lasko is another associate professor in our department who also is a world expert computer scientist and who has done work in deep learning before deep learning was deep learning. He's been doing it for a long time and has a tremendous amount of experience in this area. We used that one-two punch to help inform a really lively discussion. Our two outside guests were Elise Adler, who was a longtime friend of mine and one of the leaders in the Nashville Public Library. Elise is an incredibly thoughtful person, and as I think you'll appreciate, really takes the time to try to understand things and ask incredibly insightful questions. Finally, we have Frenika Mentor, who is a senior research scientist here at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Frenika has always impressed me by being a very, very articulate and very, very witty person, but who also has a deep understanding of the field of informatics already, but in an area that's slightly different than what we're going to be talking about today. So I really look forward to both Elise and Frenika giving us kind of a layperson's view, as we always have on this show. We talked a lot about artificial intelligence in this new report that you'll see in my show notes called Artificial Intelligence in Medicine, The Hype, the Hope, the Promise, the Peril, which came out of the National Academy of Medicine in the last couple of months. We also got into the reality of what is actually going on with AI in medicine right now. What do we know works? What do we still have as areas of study, and where do we think the future lies? Interestingly, we got into the whole conversation about what Michael and Tom called the dark side of AI. That was a term I'd never heard before, but I have to say the concept is one that we are all quite familiar with and is an unfortunate reality of anything that we do that's innovative in medicine and really in society. We did talk a lot about sensationalism versus science, i.e. what the press may say about work we do versus what their work is actually about, and I thought that that was an incredibly important part of what we discussed. I want to also make sure that I give a shout out to Eric Topol, who's a well-known cardiologist and expert in the field of digital health, sort of thinking about the patient-facing side of healthcare, who has a great book out called Deep Medicine which informed a lot of my thinking in this topic. And then Abraham Verghese, who I finally had a chance to meet when I was at Stanford about a year or two ago and have been in love with the work that he's done in the past, really helping us to think about the human side of medicine. Uh, I hope that they both have a chance to listen to this podcast. I certainly have enjoyed listening to theirs over the year. And uh, I think there's a lot of information in here for everybody. Okay, so without any further ado, Let's get to it. Everybody ready? Mm -hmm. Ready? Mm -hmm. 
Right? Right? Nervous? <laughs> <laughs> okay, everybody, welcome to Informatics in the Round, the show that, as we say, is organized so that my mother can finally understand what I do. Uh, I have a number of great guests in the room, and um, I'm, of course, Kevin Johnson. I'm an informatics geek and do a lot of other fun things. What do you guys do? I'm Elise Adler. I'm sort of a geek, a different kind of geek. I am the Assistant Director for Community Engagement and Education for the Nashville Public Library. That sounds fancy. It's a great job. It's a creative job. I do anything from early literacy to adult literacy to a, a, a health initiative that we have throughout the library and digital citizenship. And Okay, so I have to just ask. When you're at a bar and somebody asks you what you do, what do you say? Usually I say I'm a star of stage and screen. Oh, you know, oh yeah. Okay. It's a good icebreaker. <laughs> <laughs> that would work. It would be right. a total lie. But yeah, you the know. public library is a little bit of a buzzkill sometimes. <laughs> Because as opposed to informatics. Right. right. Yeah, right. Right, exactly. Right. Tom? So I'm Tom Lasco. I'm an MD, but I don't practice. But I do do uh, research in applying AI to medicine. If I'm at a, a party, let's say, I don't go to bars very much, but yeah. if I'm at a party, I tell people that I do medical AI. Fancy. So I have a PhD in computer science that focused in this area. Tell me about, tell everybody about the game that you've been working on. <laughs> uh, so that is trying to use AI to um, tell a story as you interact with the real world, as you, um, the old, there were, in the old days, when I was young, there were these games that you would type in, pick up the key, and use, use key on door, yeah, all these kind of uh, adventures, kind of computer games, and my brother and I are working on a project that tries to take that out of typing into a terminal and doing it in the world, real world, so, and we're setting our first one at Disneyland, so you... That's um, awesome. Make your way through Disneyland trying to solve puzzles and answer questions and stuff like that. And the, you use it on your phone. The, your phone detects the things you do, including the rides you ride and the places you go and stuff like that. That's awesome. Thanks. That sounds really cool. I didn't know that about you. <laughs> this is why we're here. I didn't That's know what we were talking about that. I had, to let, I had to leave something as a surprise. Okay. Michael? Yes. Yeah. My name is Michael Matheny. I'm, I'm a primary com uh, physician clinically and do a lot of work in machine learning and predictive analytics, some of which uh, I guess the new buzzword, of course, is AI, um, although a lot of what Tom and I and others have been doing for years have, have still been under that rubric but called many things. Um, uh, I also do some health services research uh, crossover work within informatics and do that within both Vanderbilt and the Department of Veteran Affairs. That sounds like you're busy. Sometimes that, that happens to all of us. And yet you're not drinking Prosecco. Uh, yes, yeah, no, today was a water day, I guess. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, there it is. Who are you? Hi, I'm Franika Mincer. I'm a research project manager, um, and I'm quite busy as well, so I drink the Prosecco. Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just glad to be here with all you guys. Well, thanks for coming. <laughs> so, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about today's topic because I recognize that some of what we do in informatics, nobody knows anything about. And then some of what we actually do, people think they know a lot about, but they actually know sometimes less than they think they do. And this is one of those topics. So I went through the newspaper because right now, probably the hottest topic everybody hears about is AI. You know, whether it's your Tesla or your, your voice assistant in your house or all the things that are now part of consumer technology, everybody thinks they've got this. They've also seen the same movies that I've seen, right? So they've seen The Terminator and they've seen Minority Report and they're imagining all sorts of future worlds which range from being terrified that soon these robots will be taking over and become sentient, realize that the entire network is theirs for the calling, that we are batteries for them, etc. to it's completely a, a pendulum that swung too far, it's going to go away, healthcare's not going to in any way capitalize on this to everything in between. So I wanted to start out by just asking everybody who thinks about this from the standpoint of not doing research in it, that would be Fredika and Elise, what do you guys think of it? Are you, have you thought about it? Have it? Has it worried you? Has it been on your radar screen? Well, I know that I don't know enough about it to be scared yet. That's or good. as scared as maybe I should be. Mm -hmm. And That's yeah. by the way, that's very telling. So that means you think you maybe should be afraid, but you don't know enough yet to decide to how to weigh in on that. Right. And I, it, just has, <laughs> it has not been on my radar, quite frankly. Yeah. It hasn't. We have had discussions about health care and privacy and having information out there, which I have thought about, and I don't know how this relates to that, which is both the good news and the scary news. So my assumption is this is going to be some of, that, some of the same. That's, that could be true. 
Pradika, what do you think? I'm looking at some of these titles to some of these news reports. Uh, how worried should we be about artificial intelligence? Yeah, I'm I'm very worried because right. the fact that you have to put that in a title. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little fact, heads up. Right. That raises your awareness. And then I see this other title, AI is learning to read mammograms. Do I really want someone else to look at my breast? <laughs> you know, I just... But it's a computer. I, I, who's behind the computer? Nobody. That's, <laughs> that's why it's that's AI. That's why, that's well, why so. I have to think about things like that. And then, and see how artificial intelligence could transform medicine. Mm, in what ways will it transfer, you know, transform medicine? You know, like, I mean, what should I expect? if it transfer, transforms medicine. So, so think about, here's how I would say that. Think about I'm just parts, of your, <laughs> parts of your life today that use computer technology mm -hmm. and take that an order of magnitude further in. So for example, if you're using Siri, for example, do you use Siri or Alexa or any one of those mm -hmm. things? Right. So imagine that you might actually be able to ask much more sophisticated questions or get responses to questions you haven't even asked yet. Like for example, it's time for your screening. Maybe it, maybe maybe Alexa is going to be the first recommender to you to receive your next mammogram. Well, I already feels like feel like it's tracking me anyway. So, uh -huh. <laughs> so yeah, I feel like I'm being spied on. Like if you like, I could be like searching for something, and next thing I know, I see an ad later, or I say something, and my phone is near me, and then all of, all of a sudden I see an ad mm -hmm. about what I just said, and I'm like, uh, am I being spied on? So. So, Tom, is she being spied on? Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Do you have anything to hide? Absolutely. I don't have anything to hide. <clears throat> no, but uh, yes, we are. Uh, maybe not to the extent that you're talking about. I think a lot of these coincidences are, uh, we just notice things. Like, So, for example, if you start dating somebody that drives a red Nissan, suddenly you see red Nissans everywhere, right? And I think some of that is this. I I haven't heard of deliberate listening to all of your conversations and you know so Siri does listen to stuff and Alexa does listen to stuff but I don't think they listen to everything deliberately only by accident and then turn that into ads so how does but, that happen that happened to me too I if, if someone was in my office I looked up a museum that I had never heard of in Boston mm -hmm. and the next day on Facebook I so had that's ads. a different question if you if you if you do a search on that, okay. somebody is listening to that, mm -hmm. and they are turning that into That has ads. nothing to do there. Okay. Yeah. Well, apparently and whether or not, I don't know the connection between Google and Facebook. If there is, if you search it on Google, suddenly it shows up in Facebook. Mm -hmm. I don't know about that, that connection. So I think that's using, mostly through cookies. Is that through? I think almost all of that has to do oh, with so Facebook the, captures your, your Facebook searches. Facebook can look at your searches and your cookies. cookies. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so, I have my cookies? so what the heck is, <laughs> do you know what your cookies are? I do not know what okay, my cookies Okay, well, are. I will take a stab at cookies. I was trying to quit the cookies. But so, yeah, I know. Cookies, <laughs> okay. Put it this way. Cookies are fattening even to computers. How about that? Okay. So, I can relate to that. That's something I can you. understand. Yeah. Well, the whole idea is that when you search the Internet, if you, if you, I'm sure you've gone to a site, you've logged in, you've logged out, you've gone back to that exact same site, and you're logged in automatically. I'm sure that's happened to you at least somewhere. Maybe through Google. Mm -hmm. Google's very good at logging you back into Gmail, for example, and back into Google when you log in. Your picture's on the upper right. Have you ever noticed this? You know, I haven't, which doesn't mean it hasn't happened. It has. Okay. And so <laughs> what's happening is Google leaves a little piece of information on your computer in some location that it's, a, it's called a cookie, and it, res, it, re, it goes looking for that cookie when it first logs in. The cookie's like a little piece of code, a little piece of data. Mm -hmm. And it goes looking for that, and then based on having received that, it can do some, quote, magical things. So if another application goes looking for specific cookies, like have you searched, what did you find, what images did you bring up, they can exploit that information to do the things that Facebook does. Like the most common one people will say is, on Facebook I went to Amazon and I went to Google to search for Christmas gifts, and then my kid comes up to the computer and logs into Facebook and sees the exact same ads for the things I just purchased. And for a while, that used to happen very commonly because of the information that was left behind on the computer that would say, if you looked at this, you're probably going to buy this. I have no evidence that you've purchased it. Therefore, I will keep showing you ads for it because you're obviously interested. Targeted advertising. Is that AI? Targeted advertising? Mm -hmm. It can be. I think a, a really good example that sort of immediately comes to mind is a, there was a uh, Target 
where a woman, a young lady, a teenager in the home had gone and bought pregnancy tests and prenatal vitamins, I believe, and then um, and then her father gets a mailer about, you know, hey, we need, you know, why don't you get discounts on these, um, you know. And so the first disclosure to the family that she was pregnant was through uh, automated targeted mailing. That is AI because yeah. it's detecting uh, data around a patient, that, a, a person that's similar to other people and then forwarding along recommendations. So that is. So, Michael, I have to say, you know, Michael, I don't know if you realize it yet, but you are officially now like the national spokesperson for AI because of this report that just came out. So he's not really the national spokesperson, but would you no, say a little bit about this report, which is a pretty big deal? Yeah, no, I'd be, I'd be happy to. Yeah, no, definitely not the, uh, the national spokesperson, but. We're going to um, call you that today, though. I'm probably going to say it two or three more times. Uh, well, uh, well uh, You've okay. been called worse, right? Um, no, that, it was a really uh, phenomenal opportunity. Um, the National Academy of Medicine was putting together, um, they, they were trying to get a more of an environmental scan of what was out there in terms of risks and benefits for artificial intelligence healthcare. And a committee formed, and about 30 of us, 30 authors over the span of two years, contributed wow. to, to a 267-page uh, book really going through the history of artificial intelligence in and outside of healthcare, looking at some of the applications, some of the wins, and some of the really um, problematic failures of AI in healthcare in recent years, along with um, re- recommendations for best practices of how to develop uh, artificial intelligence algorithms, how to deploy them in healthcare systems, and some of the regulatory and legal framework and limitations that are currently in place that wow. um, yeah. that can really cause trouble for, for people wanting to use AI in healthcare. What, and so what's this called? It's called artificial intelligence in healthcare: the 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 hope, the hype, the peril, the promise. Oh, that's great! A little alliteration. That's kind of nice. <laughs> yes, yeah, nice. I can't take credit for that. There yeah. are others that that are much better at acronyms and and titles. But even in that report, there's uh, this whole idea of the yin yang. There's hype. There's hope. Yes. But there's also peril. And and where did the report? I mean, looking at all the the press releases and whatnot. Is this report cautiously optimistic, cautiously pessimistic, wildly optimistic, wildly pessimistic? Where is it? I, I, I personally tend to say guardedly optimistic. Uh, I think um, you know Eric Topol uh, tweeted around, uh, around it right after its release and was sort of um, um, realistically pessimistic or some similar. So yeah. I think it really does try to get at the, the midpoint, the equipoise between the vast potential for benefits and also the, the wrong potential for harm. So at least what were you going to say? Well, so remember when you asked me if I was scared? The answer is now yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've changed, and it didn't take that long. So here's what Now I'm you know saying. enough. Yeah, I'm kind of trying to be your mom now. So here's a question. <laughs> that, so here you have all this information that as doctors you have. Right. That's the stuff we know, right? You do tests. And, and then I'm assuming you're also taking all of this other information that's out here, right? Whether it's from your searches or you're talking on your phone or right and Mm -hmm. then at some point with all of that information and so AI is just what really we have put out there we're informing AI right Uh, so no I I, yes yes and 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 no I think certainly AI is only the product of the data and, and that are used to develop it but there are a lot of design choices around who chooses which data to go in and what target the algorithms or the tools go for and those choices can totally transform the the utility and danger and, and who's and, making the choices ah very excellent question in many cases very small groups with particular uh, people isn't that they point? are yeah They're absolutely okay, people so. and in many cases a small group of people okay so this is my point we're still informing in one fashion or another yeah it's still being kind of these it's which is just scary anyway. But the other thing to me is, so I see the benefit. I see, I see that there could be a benefit of all of this information that we've never been able to do to, this is a podcast so you can't see it, but wrap right. our heads around or our arms around. But it is coming from all over. So how does, I'm saying it because I don't know what it is, but how does it know to filter the right information in the right context for the right reasons? That's, I, do you want to? <laughs> I'm, I'm happy well, I to. Think, that okay. I think the, yeah. well, the right information in the right context, it does that using examples of stuff happening. And it, it learns to map A onto B, where it has many examples of a phenomenon happening. That's what AI is all about, or that's what machine learning is all about, at least. Mm-hmm. It's a sub, subtopic of AI. And machine learning is all about if you don't understand the rules that govern a particular phenomenon, but you have many examples of it happening, that you can, you have data about those examples, then you can get the computer to learn how to 
what are the rules that govern that and what are what are the elements of your life that it knows about that inform your your buying choices and then it tries to use those to persuade you to buy so, the, so it, it learns what those things are so just like people have in better information or worse information mm -hmm. so when you talk about machine learning like your machine might have better experience in something but your machine I mean is this a possibility like are we all using the same machine we're not right I'll try I can start this the answer is we're all using the same machine. So the way yeah. AI works, think of it this way. Okay. AI as a field takes all these data, essentially comes up with ways to infer things or to induce or deduce things by pooling all those data. So why it's becoming and we're so much all more pooling prevalent. The same data, we all have the same universe of data. When data are provided to a an environment that's going to attempt to learn. It, we try to capture as much data as possible from everywhere that data, data are easily obtained. But interestingly, why this is a field that we think about in informatics has to do with the fact that not all data are alike, right? So if every single thing came across as highly structured, you know, one-syllable words, maybe, maybe it would be easier than if there were lots of ways to represent the information, there were images that represented the information, there were ways that maybe weren't even easily computable that are out in the world, like streaming data or other types of data that you've seen. So there's lots of formats of data, some of which is ready for AI to apply, be applied to, some of which it's not. So there are biases, and hopefully we'll right. talk about that a little bit, but the idea is it's a reasonable representation of some particular world that's designed hopefully, to answer a particular set of questions. And then once we develop the features that help it to answer that question, those features, whenever they appear, can be used to kind of trigger some kind of an alert or some kind of recommendation or something like that. Was that close? Yeah, that was very good. Thank you. I think the only ad I would make probably is I think some of the things that have been most successful are really tightly focused uh, situations in which the data are relatively uh, well characterized, clean, and really represent the problem. I think healthcare has so many problems, and I'm sure we'll talk about it, but yeah. data fragmentation and incomplete access to data that you end up with problems in how these things are developed. And as you're utilizing that AI here, the people on the other side of the world are utilizing the same data? No. Part of the problem. Why would you think they were? Well, that's what I was asking about the machine. That was kind of my lame is way of trying machine? to ask it. I think is I, it the same ideally machine? we would we would want it all to be the same right. algorithm. Like we would want to understand the things that make country A different from country B. We want to include that in our model and in mm -hmm. being able to predict various things. And that's one of the problems with medical data is it's not only countries that are different; it's hospitals that are different from each other. Right. That the the, the the practice patterns at hospital A are very different from hospital B, and so outcome prediction of things like is this patient going to get very sick or going to get septic during their stay? Models that can predict that very well for one hospital don't do so well in another hospital because of these differences. And that's one of the that's one of the standard problems is trying to understand and fix. Well, let me that. ask you a question about that. So New York Times <laughs> says that AI can now read a mammogram. And if I were sitting with a bunch of friends, I think the question I would expect them to say to at least this point is, well, if it's working, can't we take the exact same mammogram reading algorithm anywhere in the world and it should be able to read a mammogram equally well? You would want it to. You think it can? Uh, no. Right. Most <laughs> people won't understand this, so why can't it? Well, also, is are all mammograms created equally? That's yeah, what My mammogram, let me just tell you, I have artists. one, it was not equal to yours. That's not, also, <laughs> there's different this devices to use for mammograms. So uh -huh. maybe all mammograms uh, Look, my devices doc, don't they're not. capture the same thing. My doctor wanted me to go to one place because she didn't like the place I was going. Now, what was that about? I'm assuming it was about the machines, and I'm assuming it was about the image and their quality. And so then the AI only has to work with what it has. Right. Right? Yes. Okay. Right. I, I'm going to make a possibly controversial statement. If, if the, it's if a podcast. It, you're okay. Oh, awesome. Oh, well, I'm, I'm going to People are uh -oh, like, they're in line at McDonald's. They can barely hear what you're saying. They're trying to, like, explain. Uh, they, 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 they don't want pickles. Right. Exactly. Yeah, so well, just go ahead. Just put it out there. They don't so really I, know it's you saying it. So. Yeah. Excellent. Even better. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Michael. So in a, in a, <laughs> now, now I have lost. Um, no. Um, I think in an, in an information state where you sort of uh, um, approach complete understanding and complete uh, data collection, complete information, um, you would have a tool that would be operable on everyone. I think 
you know, mammograms is an excellent example where, you know, young uh, patients are different than older patients. There's different um, sort of characteristics of their breasts. Um, certain uh, racial uh, and ethnic uh, groups have different profiles, um, have different norms. If the data that the mammogram is using to build its system doesn't, isn't representative of the group that it's being used on, then you're, you're at high risk for, for problems. Exactly. I would have thought the same thing. Yeah. And, it's, and it's not just those uh, issues that are the problem. It's things like if the, if the mammogram was set up slightly off or if it's a little bit out of focus or if there's a little bit more noise on the sensor, there was some little issue, those are problems that don't affect human uh, radiologists when they read a mammogram. But a lot, of the, a lot of these AI solutions to reading stuff like mammograms or retinal images or whatever, those are much more strongly affected by these little perturbations of things because they're not in the data set. They're unexpected. But, but can't we use the same AI or other AI to identify the quality of the study and make a decision that this is a mammogram that it's not going to try to read because it's either off or overexposed or underexposed or maybe there's something about the contour of the breast that is atypical of what it's used to seeing in its data set? Can we, in other words, can we train AI in some form to be a part of its own quality control? I think that's part of the idea. Uh, you, you agree, yeah, no, you're I nodding your head. I think, I, I think that's the idea, and 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 uh, algorithms don't usually just say yes or no. They give you a probability that, that it's yes, and so 0.99 is very high confidence, and 0.2 is fairly low confidence that it's a positive. And then the idea is that you would take the the, the numbers in the middle, 0 0.5, 0 0.4, and say it doesn't really know what this is, and maybe I'll do something else. But in reality, that's not always what happens. That it. Algorithms can be very overconfident or underconfident in things. They can be fooled if you're deliberately trying to fool them. They, there's lots of reasons for that kind of idea to break down in practice, although it is part of the whole plan. So algorithms are very much like people. <laughs> well, you know, it's a really good point. I mean, honestly, I think that's right. I think the whole idea of, you know, computers that play Go, mm -hmm. right, which was one of the first examples of unsupervised learning, where basically you put a lot of examples in front of a computer of ways, you know, goals, and it figures out ways to get there without you ever telling it what was closer or further from the goal. It just learns it. The assumption is that those types of computer technologies are somehow better than their creator because all they're doing is using the data. But the fact of the matter is you're right. If we aren't able to get the data that are fully representative, so a crazy example, if, if they're I'm embarrassed to say this on here. This we did. We ended up calling, covering syphilis in one of these, and I'm about to go someplace just about as bad. If we find some island of women with pendulous breasts and identify a way to do mammograms looking for breast cancer, those algorithms, I would guess, shouldn't work because there's a significant difference in intensity when you take that same X-ray through a really, really big breast versus a really small one, which is why when they do the plates that you guys go through that thankfully we don't have to, we just have to wear ties, that you know, <laughs> when you go through those plates, I'm sure they do a lot of things to sort of adjust and get the right amount of tissue, right? And they smush more or less depending on all sorts of things that I don't want to think about. So I think the whole point basically well, being... Well, that silenced the audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> What do you say after that? Kevin, uh, Kevin does a breast monologue, and everybody shuts up. Yeah, you, yeah the, the gay guy talks breasts, and it does not go well. So I'm curious, when, when you guys were discussing this in the report, um, I imagine, I've been on some of these reports before, too, and one of the questions is always, this is such a hot topic, we may need to do another one for example, or we may need to do a follow-on. Did that come up? Not for our group immediately, but the Governmental Accountability Office has been asked by Congress to do some follow-ons in three specific areas that will be coming out over the oh, next right? year. Yeah, and so they'll be leveraging. Uh, so NAM and NASIM are sort of... Quote, What's NASIM? Uh, National Academy of what, Science, Edu Engineering, and Medicine. Okay. And uh, so they're collabor they're portions of NASIM and um, the Government Accountability Office that are collaborating, and some of this report will be used for some of that. Yeah, because this is changing so fast. I mean, it people is. like you are going to ask questions like that that are going to make people like Michael and Tom ask different questions as well. I also have a question about government accountability. Can I go there? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to ask Pranika. So she's sitting here, and the facial expressions that nobody can see on, on the podcast. I'm taking it all in. Actually, I had a question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, how often, so in your day-to-day -day life, how often do you feel like you're using artificial intelligence in just getting your day-to-day -day life done? I think it's 
every day. I think it's, I think, like, like I said earlier, I think I'm being spied on or I'm thinking that my, my phone is learning me or my computer is learning me, both at work and at home. So I've noticed something. Sometimes some of the things I pull up at work track me all the way home and I don't know how, but... <laughs> But yeah, so I think, yeah, I think it affects you day to day. It makes me think of any kind of security and privacy things that, that may pop up, like what things in that that area that AI affects and uh, any other kind of ethical issues that may come up. What, do you have, what kind of phone do you have? I have an Android. When you turn it on in the morning, mm-hmm. does it tell you things like the weather where you are? Yes. Does it give you a sense of how long it's going to take you to get to work? Yes. Okay. Have you ever told it how you're going to work? No, it just tracks it through an app I have. Yeah, but don't you think that's kind of amazing? Yeah. So I wake up in the morning, and I have those same things, and I immediately start channeling the kind of parent stuff my parents are dealing with with their health issues, right? And I think, boy, if I could, if my mom could just turn the phone on and be reminded about her doctor's appointment and have it automatically call the accessible ride people, so that we don't have to deal with all this as a family. I'll get a call at 7 in the morning from my mom saying, I have a doctor's appointment and I have no ride. I'm like, okay, I'm 900 miles away, right? But I wish, to, I wish the technology that's already doing this could be applied to healthcare in a way that I don't have to deal with that. That, that it's already called an appointed, an accessible ride to be available to take her because it knows how long it's going to take to get to her appointment. So that's, you know, to me, that's all about the hope. I see these technologies that are currently working in our pockets right now, and I imagine a healthcare scenario and say, that's what I want you guys to work on for me. You know, that's what I want is to have that kind of prediction throughout my life. Even even medication reminders, like take your medication, something like that, that would be great. But you realize it'll require tracking. Yeah, it requires tracking, and it will require... I, I just want to know what, what privacy issues you know, surround those. Because, I mean, I, I'm feeling like it's kind of sort of invading the privacy of those people, you know, tracking them. Because I know when I go to, I know when I go to Walgreens, they, they're like, oh, you're at Walgreens at such and such in place, and, you know, this gotten mm-hmm. this many reviews. Did you get what you want? Oh, we can show you the ad for this week. <laughs> it all pop up. And, uh, you know, and are you following me? Are you spying on me? Or, I mean, some people like those kind of things. They want those kind of things. Well, I'm thinking in, in the example that you posed with your mom, I think... And we can do this now. I mean, she needs to be the person to, I don't know what it is, press a button, flip a switch, Mm -hmm. that then says, yes, I need a ride. Because if it happens, I don't know, that she gets this ride all the time, every Tuesday at 9 o'clock. Right. So somewhere something just knows we need to appear at your mom's place at this time. Well, then you take her to the Bahamas, and here's the place. Here's the car ride, but she's not there. So you would say that, yeah, and see, of course, my answer to that is, well, there's other data that should make that pretty clear. Because my phone, no, let's just say I've checked into Facebook. And so I've checked into Facebook. I'm in the Bahamas. So it should be able to do what's called truth maintenance. It should be able to mm-hmm. say all these other things that I was expecting to happen today aren't going to happen now. So is this crazy talk we're, we're looking at well, here? So I actually, I'm actually kind of gratified by the fact that the, the things that you two are afraid of about AI are things that we actually ought to be afraid of. Yeah, and, and I agree. not not things of they're going to take over the world it's going to be skynet right. it's going to be terminate you know the, the, the singularity is coming computers are going to wake up and and make us their <laughs> slaves be anything worse than what Pe- <laughs> that, that that shows up Don't you know go pe- there. There, there there are things uh, that people write about those things and people are afraid of them uh, when they don't understand what computers can actually do our colleague Scott Nelson pointed out that People who study sharks for a living are not afraid of sharks when they go swimming in the ocean, but people who don't are. And people who don't might be afraid of sharks in the lake. And he jokes that he tells his kids that there are sharks in the lake, and, and so they're afraid of them. <laughs> so watch out for those lake sharks. And they totally believe them because they don't know about sharks. And it's the same thing with, it, it's actually nice that you're worried about what I would call the dark applications of AI, which is, I classify those as AI that is trying to persuade you to do something that you otherwise wouldn't do. And in its most benign form, that would be buy something that you wouldn't normally buy. But you can imagine, we're not going to go there, lots of other things that would that, that we could be persuaded to do or not do or what, you know to think or whatever that is using our own information against us for the benefit of somebody else. Like that AI is out there. 
it's mostly just to sell us stuff, to get us to spend our money. It's been doing that since, you know, the loyalty cards at the grocery store, long before mm-hmm. the AI explosion. They give you coupons when you right. check out, but they don't give you the coupons for the thing you just bought because that doesn't benefit any. That doesn't benefit them. They give you coupons of something that you might buy with that extra nudge, right? And that can be used for positive purposes, but it can also be used for dark purposes. And right now, who knows how much? But my sense is that there's a lot of the dark stuff going on, and I think that is maybe what drives a lot of our concerns about. AI being used against us, our, our own data being collected. and But you could imagine that same data being collected and used for us, right. like you sure. all have been talking about, sure. used to our benefit, used to say, you know, to predict the onset of a disease that we could prevent if we just stop these behaviors that it's detecting that we do based on what we buy. And So are there any policies in place to keep people from misusing <laughs> the data? I don't know. I think there are laws. Michael, do you know if there are laws? I, I mean, well... And does uh, anybody know of them? Who's uh, governing Well, there's a couple AI. different layers to that question. So uh, There's an AI algorithm that governs AI. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. I, I wish. Yeah. Outside of healthcare, uh, I think the main issue is that uh, these technologies grew up so fast in advance of regulation to control them that um, large corporations knew the value of the data and started to incorporate incentives for patients to give away their privacy in return for free or reduced cost applications and support. And that sort of has started to actually become part of the culture and erode. I mean, there's a lot of um, discussion in the European Union and some other places about how in the public good that there might need to be limits on what data you're allowed to give to some of the because they are using the data for or for purposes that have nothing to do with your well, well-being. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. It, so let me just interrupt you for one second because I didn't think about this. So if there are large corporations who are trying to skew data, right? And I can't even think of an example that if, if somebody is getting information out there that seems like it's prevalent everywhere in order to skew data that's going to help these people. If I were a large corporation looking out for my own interest, I might just think of a way to get all of this information out there that's somehow going to benefit my organization. I don't really care what's going on over here. So, so I, th- I think for the most part, corporations right now are really interested in the uh, inputs, like getting really accurate as d- data canvassing as much as they can possibly get to leverage for their key business outcomes. Which I get. Yeah, the, the misinformation, I think, I think there have been some examples in uh, political competitions in the political arena of some... Um, intentional misinformation, but I'm less aware of that in the corporate space. Mostly it's uh, using Thank data. Well, <laughs> yeah. So here's the question. You could argue that social media companies do this routinely. Uh, like yes, they, yes, when they, yes. they sculpt your feed. We all know they sculpt your feed, mm-hmm. and they try to sculpt it to match what they believe you should be getting. Like there are political considerations taken that they think some things are acceptable and some things are not. Right. And they, they totally sculpt that to try to influence, and they uh, Facebook did the experiment on that. Like, can right. we get people to believe different things depending on what we show them? Right, the showing feed, happier right? pictures mm-hmm. or showing yeah. sadder pictures. And, and it's, it's well, so it's right. well known that this can happen, and people do it. I sort of see her comment as misinformation, which is actually seeding oh. incorrect information versus mm-hmm. sculpting uh, okay. and filtering information. Okay. But, but I, yeah, I agree but with But it's your similar. Point. And, and I would argue that the kind of the, the, the base case of we, uh, the, the, the most basic form of what you just described is advertising in general. Like, right. that's, that's what, what I would say. Advertising is all about. And I'm not only talking about advertising. No. So maybe if I decide that I have, I'm making up a drug that's going to cure breast cancer. And so I start kind of putting things out there that there have been all these studies and that these have really worked and that this person over here and that person over here in these hospitals and God knows where, right? And that this drug is really working. Does that kind of get that false information? Gets yeah, that, that is Theranos. That's, that's what, what, what I'm you're talking, talking about. about. So there was a company that, that did that famous case of people saying false things about their product in the health domain. Mm-hmm. That, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that yeah. was, it, it, it's an amazing story to me. I, I can't believe it actually but happened. The key, but the key, the point, if, if I can just connect the dots here. Yeah. So the concern would be that if we develop mechanisms that can canvas data and without actually understanding their source, their source and not without being able to explain decisions, which is another thing that AI sometimes is challenged with, is mm-hmm. telling you why a certain thing, is actually basing it all on f- fake data, then it's a little bit easier theoretically to get away with the kinds of activities that might be these nefarious 
populating information enough to change the actual prevalence of, of the truth. So let me ask a question about that. So what kinds of research do we do in informatics that fixes these kinds of issues? So the things that you say, Tom, you're, you're gratified that the concerns people have are real concerns not Skynet. Mm -hmm. What are we doing to make it easier for people to feel good about AI and the hype versus, I mean, the hope versus the hype? Well, I, I don't know. What, I don't know what we're doing in terms of um, changing people's mind other than we try really hard to write papers and scientific uh, reports that are based on data and truth and good experiments and not on hype. I think, not to get back into a, a, a another negative direction, but I think there's a lot of, the, the the scientific reports that we write and publish say one thing, and then often that gets almost flipped on its head by the popular press that picks it up and wants to say something sensationalistic, wants to make you a little bit worried or fear mm -hmm. about Skynet or something, and then they'll, they, they turn it around. So sometimes, that I was just reading the other day, an article made a claim about being able to evaluate whether an image of a thyroid Will sh will, is showing cancer or not. And the report basically said, well, we are as good as the humans, but there's a large confidence interval, so we couldn't really tell a difference. So they actually said we might be as good as the humans. But then the popular press report that I read said they're better than humans based on a really dodgy evaluation of some of the internal numbers of the things. They completely turned it around with no sense of the author said maybe, but I'm saying that kind of thing is what somebody... 30 years ago from MIT said, natural stupidity applied to artificial intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> where where they, we take, you know, a very carefully done experiment and completely either blow it out of proportion mm -hmm. about what it's saying, make claims that are not in the paper. I would, yeah, I think that's one thing. I don't know who is doing that in our field of trying to dampen those kinds of enthusiastic but misguided uh, popular reports, but that would be one thing we could do to kind of quell these fears. And who else but the <clears throat> smart, responsible people around this table are in this field and they're working on this, and are, are they as concerned and responsible and as you guys are? So, you know, I, I, I do feel like there is a large community of, you know, multidisciplinary computer scientists, uh, informaticians, data scientists, biostatisticians, um, human computer interaction experts that are really trying to go about sort of picking away at this. So, from detecting bias in algorithms to, uh, you know, surveilling the performance of algor uh, the algorithms in practice to, um, you know, to really uh, promoting, like in the last year and a half, there's been a real swell of uh, concern and visibility around the ethics of like maybe you shouldn't analyze that in the first place um, you know and and there's there are good principles and there are there are sort of uh, both in the healthcare and in computer science there are principles around fair and ethical use of technologies and devices but I've really uh, I've been heartened in the last year that uh, that the visibility and the work around trying to make these things uh, more equitable and representative has really uh, been pushed forward uh, there's a long way to go, but I think there's been a lot more awareness in the last year than, you know, three or four years ago, there really wasn't as much, I think, um, visible about that. I want to take a slightly different tact on this answer. You're asking the question, well, who, who's in this space? I think the answer is everybody. And, and that, that literally is the big challenge, because I believe the point that Tom's making, and part, frankly, why do I have a podcast? Well, one of the reasons to have a podcast is to get experts to talk about things in a way that people can understand them. Because when I write a paper, if I try to write it in a way that you would understand it, the only thing I can guarantee is it'll never be public. Because we will have to water <laughs> yeah, down right. scientific material in a way that will then make it very subject to harsh critique, which means it will be reviewed negatively, not get published. So we have to say things the way you said them. But when you say the word, I mean, I learned this with, I think it was Wag the Dog, right? When I write that there might be an association. I'm also, by the way, now writing that there might not be an association, right. which means I am giving the press two potential stories depending on which one they think is going to be more sexy. So if I, if I am trying to confirm that there might be an association between the source of the data and the accuracy of a mammography, I'm also saying there might not be, right? So if you want to be all about the hope, all you do is you take my exact paper and say, Johnson reports the possibility right. of this association between blank and blank. Because I did actually report that, but that was actually not the intent of the work. And so 
you, you add enough of those together and you end up with something that's falsified. And unfortunately, that's from the most well-meaning of us. Now you potentially take people who might be getting their funding from a particular group, which is why a lot in medicine, a lot of times in medicine when you have industry-sponsored studies, which means there is some group that stands to benefit from a result you get and other groups that actually stand not to benefit, it's very difficult to get those published. <clears throat> Because the question is, to what extent did there was there any vetting by that funder, or even subconsciously vetting by you, that I would really hurt my colleagues at name your favorite company who given me this multi million dollar grant if I actually say that there's no difference between their thing and placebo? So maybe the way I'll say that is that our study was limited by X, Y, or Z, and it was not we were not able to determine if there was a difference. Because now what I'm actually saying to the press who wants to see it this way is, there still might be a difference, but my study didn't do enough, a good enough job. There are all these limitations, right? So I think a little bit of what we worry about is the literature itself may not be communicating as many of the facts around what's happening with AI as possible. It might be, but it might not be, because I can do the same thing they do. The other is that there are groups of people who are going to run with this stuff. And whether we think it's useful or not, it's going to show up. And I think there are other people who are concerned that the way it's going to show up is that you will see it, you, Franika, and Elise will see it before Tom, Michael, or I will see it because they would want to market to you who can't do the analysis mm -hmm. to see whether it's really working or not. It's a, it's a very interesting and complex time, and I'm sure you guys had lots of testimony about this in your report, Michael. Is it going to have any effect on the increase of health costs or the decrease of health costs? Oh, my costs? God, what a great oh, question. That is an awesome question. That, that is, question that deserves awesome. more Prosecco. <laughs> <laughs> malpractice suits because you can't sue Another good question, AI, yeah. right? Oh. So it's funny that you asked the first one because I was asked that yesterday. Oh, okay. By somebody who had a quiz. <laughs> yeah, he's filling it up here. <laughs> here, hold on, hold on. Hold on, one more. Okay. There it is. I'm hoping that's, that Mike got that. That's, okay. I'm sure it did. That's great. Um, thank you. Um, so I, I think it's both. I think uh, there is absolutely a uh, risk that um, these algorithms, if they're targeted to uh, if the intent is to try to, um, you know, diagnose and uh, and figure out sort of what what's going on with the patient, there's an opportunity for increased healthcare utilization, increased diag uh, diagnostic tests, potentially increased adverse events. It all depends on how the tool is used, how it's trained, and how it's deployed, and what the culture and workflow is around what's what it what it's going to do. There's also an opportunity to reduce healthcare utilization and improve patient outcomes in healthcare. So it, you haven't used the word cost. The cost is Im it was implied in okay. the increase in the utilization and okay. testing, and, and also cost in uh, treating the complications from the additional diagnosis. So it could increase. I'm just talking about it. Mind. could I also could decrease. If the decrease, AI yeah. is, is more precise in its answers, that it doesn't give false positives that need to be worked mm -hmm. up, then it decreases the cost. Absolutely. Part of the answer to this goes back to the term AI. There are two different ways we use that term now. A lot of times in healthcare, people replace what is often called artificial intelligence with the idea of augmented intelligence. Subtle difference. Michael, what's but the important. difference? important, yeah. Uh, artificial intelligence in some respect, well, it's a large umbrella of tools, but the distinction that you're trying to get at is that augmented intelligence operates with the final decision-making capacity resting in human hands. And artificial intelligence can be augmented intelligence, but it can also be fully autonomous agents. So, Autonomous meaning? Uh, just uh, executes, uh, so it actually does its predictions and then uh, makes the decision and, and makes the change or implements whatever uh, it, it was told to do without any human intervention. Like a self-driving car yeah, excellent versus example. a car that just warns you that you're going to back up into somebody. So exactly so. Is yeah. there a company, this is a lot of this is software, so ultimately in, in a driverless car, I mean, someone stands to make money on this or they stand to make money on that mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. Now I'm assuming that there are companies that kind of make all this happen through software, right? Hopefully us. I'll put this point. <laughs> 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 oh, yes. <laughs> that was Michael. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a there are um, massive amounts of capital going into uh, industry right now on the premise that it will have a return on investment. Hasn't yet really, I think, been but realized. Well, don't let her trap you. But Elise, everything Elise, we, do in, everything we do in medicine yeah. makes money for Elise, somebody. Yeah. Uh -huh. Are you in a non-for-profit? 
Um, I no, you, I'm in government and work with a non-for-profit, which correct. can make a profit. No, I correct. understand. It's not I'm a business only, model. Yes, and I'm only saying this. It's not. I, I guess it, what I'm saying is that it's going to make money at the benefit of making the money and then forget about being a positive. So I have to comment on this. So Eric okay. Topol's book, and Eric, I hope you're listening to this. Um, and Abraham, I hope you are too, by the way. Eric Topol's book, Deep Medicine, ends with this fabulous chapter that talks about what medicine might do with the AI future we're all hoping for. And the point that he makes is, right now the realities of medicine are, we are completely driven by the fact that the elevators are expensive, the hallways are wide, the equipment is high tech and expensive, and we have to make money to replace it as it goes bad, right? Mm -hmm. So we need Michael to see as many patients as Michael possibly can, because that gets us payments from insurance companies that is used to pay for the monitors, the elevators, et cetera. Now, AI comes in, Michael's tired. He's been working 30, 40,000 patients a day. You know what I mean? <laughs> the guy is just as, and then writing 10 papers, being on a book. But seriously, he's working pretty hard. AI comes in, and it turns out that we uncover a way that a third of the work that Michael would normally do, we can now offload because we can send things to the patient. We can do a lot of the analyses so that he doesn't have to write as much in the chart and automate documentation. We can do a lot of other things, right? This is a future that doesn't exist, but it could. So all of a sudden, Michael's, let's just say he sees, what do you see, about 20 patients a day when you're in clinic? Uh, t 12? My one day a week of, of clinic, <laughs> uh, yes, that's yeah. about right. So let's just say that his 20 patients a day that take him how many hours? Um, well, it's a four-hour in the morning and a four-hour in the afternoon officially with the unofficial overhead of all of the documentation. So let's just say it takes 24 hours to <laughs> 20 patients. Right? <laughs> okay, so 24 hours. Okay, too much yeah. for so yeah. 24 hours suddenly goes down to 10. And he's got time back. And he can go see Hamilton and not feel like he's got charts to do that night. We in medicine have a choice. Do we let him keep seeing 20 and give him his 10 hours to go home and enjoy family? Or do we go, wow, we can easily give him another 20 patients now. The big choice is going to be not the one you're concerned about, which is who's going to make money from it, because everybody's going to make money from it, but what we do with it. Do we? Does this technology actually fundamentally help a problem we have in healthcare, help you guys to feel like your doctors are paying more attention to you, or does it in fact come right back on this thing that's often called a revenue value unit or an RVU to say, Michael can make more RVUs now? And I guess from the patient perspective, I don't want to start any fights here, we're all sitting kind of close together, is not, okay, so you see this many patients, now you have this much time, like where is the consumer cost? Like I get your time and I understand um, all my the concern reasons, or, or Eric Topol's concern. Yes, and I understand, you know, I mean, so my son was just in the hospital and all the opportunities to find out what's going on were amazing. And at the end of the day, I'm thinking, okay, so now we're going to have to sell the house that I don't have or whatever, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so we are making certain things easier, and I guess from my perspective as the patient, when is that cost savings not going to just give you an extra time to do whatever it is you want to do, go see Hamilton. So does that mean now that the money comes back and is not charged to the patient? I guess I'm, I'm um, looking at the patient. I mean, that's uh, just an I mean, it's not question. an answerable question, but... Well, it, but I think it is in the sense that it's a societal question. So it it goes all the way up to the level of, you know, national health care versus private health care insurance and, you know, what the public wants and what the government system is willing to support. And, you know, certainly safeguards can be put into place to ensure that some of the gains from the these systems are sent back to the patient or those safeguards may not be put into place. I also want to say I saw Hamilton last night and it was excellent. <laughs> You realize right now Were you're you in the room where it happens. <laughs> yeah. There you go. What was one of the most exciting things you saw with, with all the testimony and everything you guys read in the book? What was the thing that you saw that you're like, I can't believe people are going to be able to do this with AI? I'm, some of the coolest things for me were all of the capacity for uh, imaging analysis. So radiology imaging, retinal imaging for diabetics, uh, skin cancer imaging, and the capacity. Um, I mean, humans get tired over large volumes of repetitious tasks, and AI is just excellent at it. And 
I think those technologies are already quite mature, and they're gonna they've they've passed the bar. They're gonna they're gonna really disseminate into pra- and and save people's lives. I mean, there's there's no doubt. And I think those those in particular, the imaging ones, uh, I'm guessing they'll be implemented as augmented instead I agree. of re- replacing. So it, there'll be computer augmented image interpretation that may you know put a little box or a green dot on the various lesions in the mammogram or the retina or the whatever it's looking at. And then the radiologist will say, yes, yes, no, no. And and it will make the read faster or it'll catch. It, humans are human and they miss stuff on x-rays all the time. Not because it's hard to see, but just because that's the way our, our brains are set up and we miss stuff. And I think those are the closest. But it's interesting to me that we've started on down the imaging route because that's in in the AI world in general imaging is the most popular domain to be working in because there were some really great advances uh, maybe six years ago in the imaging world and so it's been easier and easier to do to recognize objects and images or even things that to me mammograms look like reading tea leaves it's I I can't do it Uh, but somebody can and obviously a computer can now but that's building on things that were already known and existing in the more general AI world. People are just applying that to medicine. So those, I think, are within reach in the next 10 years. Well, it brings up a point. Do you know why imaging got so far ahead? I think it's, it, it was partly due to the fact that image data is almost by definition clean. To me, I mean, one of the really exciting things right now is the more that patients are willing to share data for projects like the All of Us project or give publicly available data, the more all of these people that we've been talking about who might be in this space right. can do what we've done in non-imaging place, in imaging for non-imaging areas. So I saw there was another point. Yeah. I to just and you know, we're out. participating in All of Us. We got a grant. I know that. Yes. Okay. Congratulations to you. Yeah, yeah. There are huge data sets, one of them is called ImageNet, that are just fo- natural photos of things that are out there. Yep. And the first successes in object recognition in images were training a computer to recognize that's a duck, that's a cat, that's a pizza, etc. And uh, they can get really high accuracy. And that was because it was that, that huge data set was sort of put out there, at, which made it an automatic competition. So every PhD candidate at every place tried their way of tweaking the algorithm to, to recognize the things in ImageNet. Mm-hmm. And so it grew. That comes with drawbacks, which maybe we won't talk about. We think a lot of the successes are just sort of by accident, that if you tried it on, on another data set that nobody would seen before, you wouldn't have as high of accuracy. Although, everybody's phone right now has mm-hmm. image analysis in it. Did you all know that? No. If you go yeah, to your you phone, knew. yeah. if you go to your phone facial and you say, no, not just that, it's got facial recognition. But the thing that most people don't know is that your phone contains, do you have an iPhone? Yes. Yeah. It contains all, most of the major early advances in AI in image analysis. So you can say things like, show me pictures of tables in my photos, and every picture that has a table in it will show up. Did you oh, yeah, see I'll this? Try that and I've done it. I was like, uh, show pictures of my mom. Yeah. Oh, really? And it, and it comes up. That's, that's yeah. really because awesome. you've labeled that as your mom. Your feet, right. you, you've, you taught your you know, phone, hey, that's your mom. Sometimes yeah. when you like pictures come up, who is this? You say, my mom, and then they'll find all the faces that are similar. (laughs) Yeah, I'm going to show you. Okay, so uh, I'm going to just pull up my phone here, and you'll have to validate that this has worked, okay? Hey, Siri, show me pictures of dogs in my photo album. All right, I'm just going to have to later see if my phone is as smart as your phone. What are those those pictures of? Um, I I see a bumper sticker in the future. My phone is smarter than your phone, (laughs) right? You're right. So you're going to do the same thing. We train our phones to do that. Yeah, I I mean, mean, so the point is that's a that's a great example. You think it's kind Mm -hmm. of a useless little Mm -hmm. AI thing, but Mm -hmm. as Tom said, it's actually a better example than it sounds like because one of the one of the old benchmarks of AI was um, some I don't remember who said it now. Some somebody in your podcast listener will email you. Um, but somebody said, I'll believe that computers can think if it can learn to differentiate a photo of a dog from a photo of a cat. And in, oh. the, in the old days, it was really hard, and now it's built into your iPhone. Yep. So it, that is, that is a, a very substantial accomplishment that, it is. that the field has been able to do. So imagine Not only that, it can, like, it, it, can, it can distinguish like a Percheron from a Clydesdale, like two different kinds of horses, to some degree. I couldn't do that myself because I don't know what they are, but maybe if I trained... 
but it's m much better than just dogs versus cats. Even, so, yeah. Imagine even, go ahead. even on my uh, Android, if you say pull out all my happy pictures, all the pet pictures that have a smile, like a real mm -hmm. nice big smile, there pop up. Yeah, and those are all the happy pictures. And so, yeah. sounds, and you know, in all seriousness, that sounds like oh, that's a cute little game. But if you then think about healthcare, right? Mm -hmm. So if I was able to say, you know, I'm the new radiologist from last from last night's radiologist has left. I come in, I go over to my packs, and I say, show me all the pictures with questionable lesions. We now know because of the work that Tom was just describing, that's a completely doable query to an EHR. So you could, on your way to work you could actually be getting the download of all of the lesions that you need to spend some time thinking about today because the computer just wasn't sure what they were. So I think we're entering into this period, especially with augmented intelligence, where cool stuff's going to happen um, as long as the bad stuff doesn't outpace it, right? As mm -hmm. long as the dark side stays minority and most of us are thinking about good things we can do with it. So if there is something that's undiagnosed, right? Someone has seizures, they're undiagnosed, and they've done all the tests, now, is AI able to look at things that, you know, like the environment, so where this person lives, how this person behaves, like certain behaviors in terms of um, drinking or, I don't know how, like if I called a mold company because there's mold in the bathtub. I mean, are, are these things that the health world can now know, okay, so we did all these regular tests but now we're looking at all this environmental stuff, which maybe if a doctor is asking the patient, mm -hmm. but they either don't know that it's relevant or remember it or think to answer in that way, is there a possibility that AI can take all these other factors that currently aren't put into consideration into consideration to help with a possible diagnosis? I think so. I think it can if it's trained to do that. See how much she has gotten from all this? <laughs> <laughs> so no. Okay, what do you guys think? Are we talking in principle or in, in current principle. practice? In principle. in principle, totally. It, 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 it would be a matter of collecting that data routinely. Mm -hmm. So in order to like identify those things, because they're going to be different for different diseases. But so you, we, we, we can't just say, all right, let's, let's uh, somehow sample air pollution and temperature and um, the stuff you order from Amazon. We'd have to like collect as much as possible and then for each different disease, the AI would figure out uh, how those things impact your, your risk of getting the disease. And that is possible once the data are collected. So I, I mean, I think there's a tremendous public health opportunity in you know, trying to harness some of the social media data, some of the routine cell phone location data, velocity data, some of the environmental, and, and use it for people's health. Like, that's such a mm -hmm. cool, uh, you know, Goal. So you saw, you saw some of that with with Google flu trends. Mm -hmm. So Google tried to take they tried to take people search terms all over the country, mm -hmm. and from those search terms figure out where the flu was happening. So if people are searching for Sudafed or right, right. whatever fever, and um, and they did that pretty successfully at least the first year. Then everything changed. Uh, this is one of the big problems with AI: the the input data changes its shape and. And stuff, and so the model stopped working as well. But the initial one was pretty impressive. Both lessons learned from the Google yeah. Flu Trends project mm -hmm. were highly valuable to the community. Both how you build a tool that was really useful to a population, they'll use it, yep. mm -hmm. and how if you don't watch, watch, surveil it, and keep it up to date, uh, bad things can bad happen. Bad things can happen. Yep. I mean, so my my view of this. So Fernika's concerns were tracking is a little bit. Spooky, creepy, scary, privacy-inducing, worrisome, right? Right, but I'm now I'm thinking we've given permission for them to track us and do all yes, that. Yes, we have. We, like when we do some of those, uh, get some apps, they have these, oh, you get permission to do this, this, and, this, and sometimes we don't even read it. We just click, okay, I just want the app. And yep. <laughs> we just... Right. So here's my killer AI idea. One of the things people are so worried about is... I need to know why you want that piece of information, right? So Apple and Android for a while now have said, my app can do something really interesting if you will let me look at this piece of information, right? That's the, that's the thing you get that says, if you turn on location services, I can better tell you X or Y. And then the, and then the phone comes up and says, would you like to turn on location services? And now you're like, well, yeah, that makes sense if it's mm -hmm. going to do that with it. They might do other things. Let's hope they don't. But that's what they're at least they're promising you. So fast forward to this day in AI where your question is, 
my son has some medical problem and I just don't know what's causing it, right? You don't know what's causing it. I'm the, let's just the say, <laughs> I am, in this case, let's just say I'm the patient. Okay. I'm the father of the son who says, my, my son has got this medical thing going on with seizures and I don't know why. Tom and Michael and others have done research and they've come up with ways in which certain environmental variables might turn out to be relevant. And so the models do know with, its, with enough information about your environment, they could tell you certain things about the relevance of that information. Migraines would be a great example of this, mm -hmm. right? So what, what, rather than you worrying about giving all your data out all the time, there's no reason why we can't develop the app to basically say, Kevin, please have your son turn on environmental notification mm -hmm. for the next week. In other words, it's like the old days, what we did was say, please fill out a diary, right? I don't really want to know everything about you, but right now I need to know your fevers. So take your temperature twice a day, write it down. So this is the computer equivalent of that. Mm -hmm. Please enable this feature. I'm going to collect an amazing amount of data from you because I need that to decide certain trends in your world that I can then use to fit this model and decide whether you are in fact a patient who has that as a risk or not, right? That's, I mean, you guys are nodding, so I assume something like that could be a way in which we deal with the privacy issues. Yeah. Which is as long as one cohort is willing to give data for training, another group of people can benefit even if they don't have those data on. This reminds me of an app I have on my phone. I've been trying to lose weight for the past year. Well, I've been semi-successful. And you've been doing quite well. Congratulations. <laughs> and I've been using Google Fit on my phone. Um, it's an app, along with other apps. But um, with Google Fit, I've just been doing my uh, exercise, how many minutes a day I've been exercising. And um, also, I've been tracking my weight on it. And if I meet like an exercise goal over a certain period of time, it's like, well, if you want to sustain this keep this weight, you keep doing what you're doing. If you want to uh, lose more weight, let's up this by this many minutes. You know, based on your trends, and mm. and and it also tracks like when you're walking. So it tracks as you're walking, like your location, because you're giving it permission to track your location. This segment brought to you by Google Fit. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not I'm just saying that's the way that some of that technology yeah. Yeah, right. gives you more recommendations yep. on how to stay or increase that activity or decrease if you want to gain weight back. <laughs> so guys, I got to say, go ahead, Michael. I was just going to say, and for the audience that didn't know why I made my comment, I work with Franika, and so I, uh, she's... Uh, you know, she's been reporting her weight loss to the group and been doing very well. I thought that you guys had just met and you were commenting. That you were <laughs> yeah, no, I realized that, uh, that the, uh, yes, no, I got that. I got that. Yeah, right, uh, exactly. Yeah right, yeah, right. How much have you had to drink? You're obviously not able to hold on to that water, Michael. You gotta worry about you. Yeah, need more water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This has been unbelievably, to me at least, fascinating. To, to kind of hear that, that tension between the recognition that some of these tools need data that you may be uncomfortable with and the fact that there really is a, a legitimate reason for the hype and the hope and the perils and the promise. I mean, the things that you talked about. I think we covered every single bit of that. Well, thanks to, thanks to Frenika and Michael and Tom and Elise. This has been really great. And uh, looking forward to uh, seeing you guys go out in the world and tell them how much you understand AI better now. Okay. All right. Thanks. We're done. Thank you.